Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. So great to have you here with us on this Friday, May 26, 2023. We want to thank you again for always supporting Lockdown Blue Devils and every single thing that we're doing here in the life of the program, your one stop shop for everything going on in Duke Athletics. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to follow this podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. Also, make sure you watch our show on YouTube each and every day. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe to our channel for new updates each and every day as we continue to move through the summertime. We've got a lot of exciting things happening here in the life of the show and want to make sure that you don't miss out on any of that. Coming up on today's show, I've got a couple of mailbag questions that we did not get to earlier in the week. I want to answer those and then also we'll have some updates for you on some weekend activities set to take place for the Duke Athletics programs. It's championship time for a lot of the spring sports, and we want to highlight that throughout today's show. So without further ado, let's dive right in. We continue our mailbag questions that were sent our way a little bit earlier in the week. A question coming in here was sent in by one of our great listeners on YouTube, Blue Devil Basketball Forever 14 sent in a question, should we be worried that the staff can't find a replacement for Lively? Uh, Talking about that center position for Duke, something that we've discussed a good bit over the last few weeks here on the program. And uh, I don't know that this Duke team should necessarily be worried. I think as Josh Cox put it earlier in the week, if Duke were not be able to find a true rim protector there at that center spot, you question whether or not they would be able to win an entire national title, but be one of the top teams in the country. I still think Duke would be able to do that. Taking a look at Kyle Filipowski and what the fit looks like for Duke at that center position is another question that was sent in. Can Duke be good? Can they win with Flip at the five? And in many ways, I do think that Duke could be successful with Kyle Filipowski at that five position. I don't know that you would want him to be there all the time, and that's where you would need other players on Duke's roster currently, like Orion Young or Christian Reeves, Sean Stewart even, to step up and do a bigger role. I think we're going to see a much improved sophomore Christian Reeves. I think that we will also see uh, Sean Stewart, who's naturally that power forward position, take a big step forward in his progress and year-over-year development. So definitely looking forward to seeing what he can do in that spot. Kyle Filipowski, someone that, as we discussed uh, throughout the season, a great offensive player. Defensively, though, was not making as big of an impact as Lively was a season ago. Derek Lively had 82 blocks in 700 minutes in his freshman season for Duke. Kyle Filipowski played over 300 more minutes than Lively did and had just 26 blocks. Again, so the defensive end of the floor was not where Flip was uh, making an imprint on the game. It was definitely what he was able to do offensively that helped Duke win so many basketball games. If you're playing that center position and if you're asking Kyle Filipowski to do a little bit more, you have to wonder if that's going to have an impact on his offensive game. Flip is a player that played all 36 games for Duke last season. He averaged 2.6 fouls per game in about 29 minutes of competition. So foul trouble would also be something that you would want to monitor if you've got a player like Flip asked to do a lot on the offensive end. We saw a couple of offensive fouls at big spots throughout this past season and then banking in the post. You're prone to pick up a few more fouls. When he was in foul trouble, and I'm going to deem foul trouble as four fouls or fouling out of a game, Duke went five and four in those contests. So twice he fouled out seven times this past season. We saw Kyle Filipowski have four fouls in a basketball game. So I do think it's uh, important to sort of monitor those things if we talk about the possibilities 
of Kyle Filipowski being a five for Duke this next season. Would love to see Duke get someone in the portal at that spot. Obviously, we've talked a lot this week about Ernest Uday Jr. Uh, earlier in the week, even Travis Branham from 24-7 Sports was on their updated weekly recruiting podcast and said, look, it's not exactly over for Ernest Uday Jr.'s chances to end up a Duke Blue Devil, but it's certainly not as much of a slam dunk as we saw. There were three crystal ball projections for Uday Jr. to end up as a Duke Blue Devil. All three of those picks have now reversed course, and they're back to undecided. Kansas State, TCU appear to be in the mix, but in the middle of this recruiting dead period, no visits have officially been set up for Uday Jr., and so we'll continue to see whether or not uh, those schools become the landing spot for him, or if Duke truly can get back into the mix, as Travis Branham, the recruiting insider for 24-7 Sports, mentioned could be a possibility for him. Uh, and then, again, the number three available transfer right now is Ernest Uday Jr., so should Duke not land him, it doesn't seem as though there is another guy out there potentially that could come back, although with it being May 26th, we've got five days left for players to decide whether or not they want to stay in the NBA draft. And if any of those guys uh, do return to school while entering the portal, we'll see whether or not Duke becomes a player in those regards. I definitely like the idea of Christian Reeves going into his sophomore season, developing a little bit more with the more playing time and more experience. I think he's got an opportunity to be more of a defensive presence than even Kyle Filipowski is. I would rather flip, continue to be that offensive focal point for Duke while also come, um, you know, bringing in these talented scoring guards that Duke's got. I, I definitely think they're set up for success on the offensive end of the floor. I think the big question that we all have is what that defense is going to look like. So, again, thanks for that question uh, that we saw earlier in the week as we've got a few more mailbag questions here to answer. Another mailbag question that I want to get to was asked of TJ Power. What can we expect out of the freshman, and does his dual sport – versatility mean anything for Duke? Absolutely. This is such a great player, uh, not only in basketball, but a top pitching prospect as well. TJ Powers got quite the fastball and the outside shot. The Athletic back in September of 2022 had a really good recruiting profile that they wrote up about TJ Power. A lot of great interviews and quotes from his high school coach, Jamie Sullivan, uh, who praised his high IQ and uh, definitely compared him to former Duke players and Mike Dunleavy and Shane Battier, kind of the role that he thinks T.J. Power could have. And I certainly uh, could see that as well. Excited to see what he could do on the offensive end of the floor with that outside shot. So really excited to see what T.J. Power can do for this Duke basketball team. A lot of great questions asked there, and really always do appreciate you guys sending in those questions to us again on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils or by sending us an email, LockedOnBlueDevils at gmail.com. While we're talking about Kyle Filipowski, I do want to give him a shout-out as well. Some of the APR scores came out, and we saw uh, on all academic team selections, Flip finished his freshman season with a 3.925 GPA. 3.925 GPA. So shout-out to you, Kyle Filipowski, wow. ACC Rookie of the Year, and also getting it done in the classroom. That's something that we absolutely love to see. All right, let's take a time out. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about the other happenings across Duke's campus here on Locked On Blue Devils. Our show today is brought to you by our friends over at Bird Dogs, one of my best and favorite apparel brands that's really gaining steam and momentum here as of late. I want you to make Bird Dogs a part of your daily life as well. They've got three things that they pride themselves on fit, comfort, and versatility. Everyone looks and feels great when they wear bird dogs. Also, the comfort with the fabric being stretchy makes it so uh, comfortable and really enjoyable when you're wearing the product. And again, when the versatility we speak of with bird dogs, you can wear it with just about anything. So make sure you check them out. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. And when you enter promo code locked on college, they'll throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every single order. Again, bird dogs is a proud sponsor of locked on blue devils. Moving forward here on the program, JJ Jackson here, the host of locked on blue devils on this Friday, May 26th. A solo episode here of Locked On Blue Devils. Want to talk a little bit about what's coming up this weekend in the life of Duke Athletics. 
uh, Duke softball getting set for a big super regional matchup as they get set to take on Stanford. The game today will be at noon Eastern on ESPN2. Saturday they play at 3 o'clock. And then should it go to a decisive game three, that time would be TBD. So uh, Duke softball, of course, swept the Durham Regional this past weekend. It's their second consecutive strip to the Super Regionals. Last year, Duke played Supers at UCLA and lost the first two games. So the series was over. This time, for the first time ever, Duke gets to host a Super Regional weekend at home there in Durham. Duke finished the year with a 48-10 and record on the season. Stanford is a team that has a 43-13 and record. It's their seventh all-time trip to the Super Regionals. They won the Stanford Regional last week where they defeated Florida twice and then also had a win over Long Beach State. There has been one single meeting all-time between Duke and Stanford in softball, and it happened this season, a game earlier in the year, that Duke won by a score of 4-2. to So we're hopeful that Duke can continue that this weekend. And if Duke were to win, again, if Duke were to get – Two out of the three wins uh, this weekend against Stanford. They would make it to the Women's College World Series for the first time ever. You can't say enough about the job that Marissa Young has done as the head coach for the Duke softball program, that Women's College World Series being from June 1st to the 9th, 2023. They're in Oklahoma City at the Hall of Fame Stadium. So best of luck to the Duke softball team this weekend. The offense has been really fun to watch this season. Young freshmen contributing as well couple of players transferred away from Duke after this past season, and yet Duke just reloaded, and it's done a really nice job. A lot of freshmen stepping up as well. The Duke baseball team also getting ready for a game coming up here today as they'll take on Miami at 3 o'clock in the ACC Network. This is, of course, the ACC Baseball Championship. Baseball tournament is what we like to say as well there. And, uh, of course, they set it up in the pool-style bracket. Duke lost earlier in the week to NC State. Duke was the number five overall seed in the ACC this season, but they lost eight to seven on Tuesday night in 11 innings against the Wolfpack. So Duke will play one more game against Miami, but there's no way for them to advance into the weekend and to sort of that bracket format play to figure out who's going to be the ACC tournament champion this weekend. Although Duke did have a big game against NC State, scoring those seven runs. And in the contest, Duke set the single-season home run record and the single-season strikeout record for pitching staff. The Blue Devil pitching staff this season has struck out 604 batters. The record was set in 2019. It now belongs to this 2023 team. Home runs was uh, the 91 home runs hit by Duke this season. That's a new single-season record for Duke baseball. The record was set in 1994, so it had stood for 29 years before the team this year was able to break that record. And speaking of 29, that's now the active hitting streak for junior Alex Stone, one of the top hitters in all of college baseball this season. Alex Stone is riding a 29-game hitting streak, and we'll see if that continues today here against Miami. Duke played Miami in the last series of the regular season. Honestly, this past weekend, just a weekend ago, Duke played the Miami Hurricanes there in Coral Gables, and the Hurricanes walked away with two of the wins. Duke won game one Friday night, but then Miami came back with some wins there on Saturday and Sunday to claim the series. Moving forward here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils, taking a look at the weekend ahead for Duke. Really excited for what's coming up on Saturday. Tomorrow, Duke men's lacrosse will compete in the NCAA semifinals from Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia, taking on Penn State. It's a noon Eastern start on ESPN2. Duke a 15-2 and two record, 5-1 and one of the ACC. ACC champions this year uh, at Penn State is 11-4. and four. On the season, Penn State uh, this past week was able to get out of the quarterfinals uh, with a win over Army. Duke defeated Michigan 15-8 to in the quarterfinals to advance once again to the Final Four. Duke is 9-0 all-time against Penn State, most recently a 20-11 win back in the year 2010, and then a 12-2 win in 2005, the numbers there for Duke. This lacrosse team is really good this season, as we talked about with our buddy Drew Carter of the ACC Network and ESPN a few weeks ago. 
this team the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament. John Donowski has done a great job with this Duke lacrosse program, who was national champions in 2010, 2013, and 2014. Again, a 15-8 to win for Duke last weekend over Michigan. Brennan O'Neill had six goals for the Blue Devils. He's such a dynamic player. I think he's going to win the National Player of the Year award. He's been that great. He had some, some incredible highlight goals this past week against Michigan, and if he's able to repeat that performance this upcoming week uh, against Penn State and then what would follow as the national championship game on Monday, I think Duke lacrosse is going to be in a really big spot. you got to have a big game from William Helm, William Helm, excuse me, who's the goalkeeper uh, for the Blue Devils. He's got to be elite, and you need offensive help from Owen Capito, Andrew McAdory, and Dyson Williams have been big-time players for Duke. And then defensively, I think Kenny Brower's got to do a really nice job of marking T.J. Malone for Penn State for Duke to be successful. Duke and Penn State in the NCAA tournament semifinals right now in Las Vegas. The Blue Devils are favored by four goals, so Duke is a big favorite in this matchup against Penn State. Knock on wood that they're able to get the job done tomorrow. And then finally, do want to give some love to Jason Tatum. And the Boston Celtics, the former Duke Blue Devil, got a big win last night after Boston was down three games to zero. They've now won two straight. No team in NBA playoff history has ever overcome a 3-0 series deficit to go on and win the whole thing. And Tatum and the Celtics have won back-to-back games. Last night's game in Boston, they defeated the Miami Heat by a score of 110-97. to Jason Tatum had 21 points, 11 assists, 8 rebounds, and 2 steals. He's been a big focal point for the Celtics this entire season. The best player that Duke has right now going in the NBA, and we'll see whether or not he and the Celtics are able to make history. So tomorrow we'll see game six. That will be played in Miami, and should Boston win that game, they force game seven on Monday night there on Memorial Day in Boston. Again, it's never been done before, but Tatum and the Celtics have an opportunity to make – NBA history, which will be super exciting. And then congrats once again to Jack White and the Denver Nuggets, who are going to the Final Four, or excuse me, to the uh, NBA Finals. Uh, Jack White, of course, did not play much for Denver this season, has not played at all yet in the postseason, but he's on the roster. He's on a two-way deal. He would get a championship ring if the Nuggets won, and so we're certainly celebrating his successes that he's having here. That's going to do it for our show today. Really do support or appreciate all the support that we've got here on Lockdown Blue Devils. Once again, my name is JJ Jackson. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore and follow the show on Twitter as well at LO underscore Blue Devils. That's going to do it for today's show. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you on Monday. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.